this afternoon and for our host. This is a wonderful opportunity. I really appreciate this precious and warm welcome. And it's wonderful to talk to you about libraries and information services in any country. So thank you very much. So what I shall do in our time together, and I hope that we'll have plenty of time for questions and answers too, as feel free. I, in addition to being um, a library, head of a library, I also teach in a library school program. I often teach on collection development, collection management. So price increases, some of the publishing trends, things like that. I would enjoy uh, talking about that as well. So you will let me know after I deliver my presentation about some of the things that are of interest to you or that are on your mind. Okay, so we're, we're doing an adjustment here. Okay, now apparently the mic is on. <laughs> So great. So everyone can hear me, right? But you see, my husband and I, um, Steve is over there. Wave, wave your hand, Steve. That's, that's Steve. So at any rate, um, Steve and I have two sons. Our the youngest son is 21, and our oldest son is 25. So I've been known to project my voice because we have raised children. So <laughs> I can certainly um, speak more loudly if, if that is needed. So, But I thank you for the mic at any rate. So it is lovely to be here. Whenever we think about what's happening now, where are we headed in the future? I had a wonderful tour of the, the new library here, and I was delighted to see that some of the same things that are we're talking about on our campus have already been done here. You're ahead of us. It is amazing in terms of where the future is going. How are our students studying? How are faculty <coughs> using and reusing information? So those are some of the things to think about in terms of the future. But well, where does this leave us as library staff currently and as library staff in the future? What skill sets do we need and what are we looking ahead to in terms of the future? So those are some of the things to discuss. One of my favorite authors is Peter Drucker. He has written, um, he's a management guru. He's written many, many, many management books. And this is one of my favorite quotes in terms of talking about the future. Certainly, it isn't deciding what we're going to do tomorrow, if that's special collections or man managing electronic resources, but what do we need to do today so that there is a future? I have talked with other colleagues in um, other countries, actually on the way here. We were in Thailand, and I was very fortunate. I have a colleague there who's a faculty member. He did his PhD with us at, at the University of North Carolina. And I was talking with him and some of his students and some of the faculty members there. And we were talking about the future. What should we be doing? Where are libraries going? and making sure that we are part of the equation. If you will, we are at the table when the discussions are happening. And that is what's so important, important to us. So what do we need in terms of competences? Certainly, library staff sizes are shrinking and the budget pressures are increasing. I was just sharing with the staff earlier with our colleagues about some of the budget challenges we are facing at the University of North Carolina. We just have finished, I, actually about two weeks ago, a journal cancellation project. It is the fourth journal cancellation project that we've had to do in five years. From a budget point of view, this is not easy. This is very, very difficult. What is the highest priority? Setting those priorities and looking at the budget that you have, the budgets are shrinking. So which way do you go? What are the most important things? We simply can't do everything. There has to be a realization of what you can do with the current, the current uh, criteria. What sort of circumstances are you operating in currently? So we are certainly doing more with less. The top priority services are being redefined. For example, on our campus, we developed, like this beautiful campus, we have a lot of uh, beautiful natural resources, beautiful trees. The campus is uphold by American standards. The campus was founded in 1793. It is the oldest public university in the United States. And we have many beautiful landscapes. Well, one of our botany professors had written a book about the botanical specimens on the campus. So one of our enterprising librarians said, you know, 
why don't we develop a mobile app for the smartphone so when students are on campus and they are standing in front of that beautiful tree, they get a little more education about the significance of that particular species, et cetera, et cetera. It was very popular. And actually some of, because we are a public university, we are open to people who live in Chapel Hill. So they were very, very intrigued too. You can see people walking around campus with the smartphone. They're standing in front of the tree and using the mobile application. And I think that's where our future is. Looking ahead to see where those opportunities are in terms of mobile applications, ebooks, etc. What do our customers want? That's really the message that I have for you this afternoon. Ah, must be a customer calling, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, speaking of customers, some of our customers are learning to be very self-sufficient. Whether they're checking out their own materials, they're consulting databases, they're using electronic resources, and the staff is being rearranged. Certainly at the University of North Carolina, we have something I never really thought I would see. Um, we have outsourced the majority of the cataloging. And for decades, it was known for exact, meticulous, perfect cataloging, if there is such a thing. How many catalogers are in here? <laughs> I'm just checking. Anybody planning to go into technical services or cataloging? So, at any rate, what ended up happening is we had a study that was done, and it was actually less expensive to have our books shelf ready. They come to the library, they're already cataloged, you put them on the shelf. Now, in special collections, with some of the language materials that we have that are not in English, then that has certainly changed. Though we still have original catalogers, people who are native speakers who are going to get the cataloging correct. That will not be outsourced. But it's been a very big change for us. So that's just one of the drivers. The cataloging staff are essentially rearranged. They might not be doing cataloging anymore. So these are the kinds of challenges. But you know, it's very exciting because that means that the job changes and hopefully competences change along with it. So that's, that's part of what we're talking about. One of my favorite quotes is from C.W. Hartman. He is an architect and talks about libraries being in transition, whether it's not only from a building type point of view, but as an institution. Essentially, embarking on a building program is there, while you may have a long tradition, like at this university, there's not necessarily a particular paradigm or a particular formula that is going to work exactly. It certainly depends on your customer base and on your clientele. So these are the things to think about. And there's the citation for you as well. The Evolving Roles of the Library in the Late 20th Century from a journal titled Research Strategies. So what are we going to focus on? How are things changing? And where does the library and the library staff fit in? Well, some of the catalysts are the forces of competition. Um, I was at a gathering. A friend was having a party a couple of months ago. And basically, you know, you do the introductions. And people say, what do you do? And I said, oh, well, I'm a librarian. And I say that very proudly, right? Because it's great to be a librarian. Well, the person said, librarian? We don't need librarians anymore, do you? You know, we have Google, right? <laughs> like, you need librarians more than ever because we do have Google. You know, and when I worked in business, when I worked in corporations, if you're making business decisions and you're using the data that you found, your business decision is only as good as the information that you're finding. And that's the value that we can bring to the table. So I'll talk a little bit more about some of the other roles that I'm seeing and reading about in terms of libraries and librarians, in terms of what is changing. Um, what about the expectations of customers and the, the group learning spaces? This is a beautiful library on this campus. You think about the gathering places, the social space, the, the quiet study space. From, uh, from that viewpoint, Things have really changed, but what you want to do is future-proof your library. You want to have flexible space that can be moved around depending on what the faculty and the students need. 
So to be able to reach, to use that, that space in a way that is flexible so that you can meet the demands of the customers, the needs of your information needs of your customers. And they certainly are, they are changing a great deal. Um, I think about the pockets of quiet, if you will, the group study space, the specialized collections, the digital collections. There are many libraries, certainly ours is just one, that have specialized digital collections, and that's where the growth area is for libraries and being able to seize that opportunity when you see it. Of course, you know, you just have to love it. We have um, very well-intentioned faculty members. They are very bright, they do amazing research, and they are wonderful teachers. But what I, I you're at a faculty meeting, and say you have, a, we had a collection of North Carolina postcards from the 1910s, 1920s, 1930s. And to give you an idea, North Carolina, uh, we're in the middle. We live in the Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill area. That's the Piedmont area, some rolling hills. If you drive about two and a half hours in the eastern direction, you're at the ocean. If you drive about three and a half hours west, you have the mountains. So we say we have the best of both, right? You want to go to the mountains or the ocean? You can do both. Well, one of our special collections uh, in the Rare Book Group had a whole series of postcards that were wonderful vignettes uh, basically of uh, the seaside and families taking vacations and what was it like in 1910 and 1900s. So we were able to digitize that. We had a small grant and that worked out really, really well. But on the other hand, you have big sustainability questions. Who's going to pay for the storage? This is not inexpensive. So there's a lot to think about with a digital project and it isn't magic because I've sat in more than one faculty meeting where a faculty member will simply say, well, why don't you just digitize it? They think you can just, I don't know, somehow perform some type of magic, not something. So <laughs> there's a lot more to it than that. Whether you're using a product like OCLC's Content DM or another type of software in order to provide digital access. Uh, digital libraries are great. It's another cost center. It's another staffing, staffing area too. So these are many, many variables to think about. So, what do our customers expect? And then, ah, generational differences. And I say this with all respect with my, my dear mother-in-law, who lives in California. She is very afraid of these. She does not like technology. She would not be caught with a cell phone. This is not her thing. Well, we had a, a family situation about three weeks ago, and she had to get a cell phone. It, she could no longer avoid, she had tried, she'd avoided cell phones for Oh, 15 years. So, so at any rate, um, my husband's brother, who also lives in California, took her to the Verizon store to buy the cell phone. And she's, she's very nervous about this. So, and we can start with the smartphone, he said, because she, she's just, it's too much. So she basically ended up getting a flip phone, very simple, that sort of stuff. And now we usually uh, text our family when we arrive. So when we arrived in Thailand, we were going to text. And she had said before we left, she said, oh no, don't text me. I can't handle texts. So whatever you do, don't text me. <laughs> so, so the generational differences are, can be a little extreme. You have my dear mother-in-law, and I say it with all respect, but she really is, is very uh, technology phobic. It, it's not something that she wants to deal with. Other people love technology. You know, our sons, for example, and I email them and say, all right, we've arrived in Malaysia. Of course, I'm going to hear nothing because all they do is text. They don't do email. They, they laugh if they think that, you know, that we expect them to send an email. The only communication that we're going to have from the 20-somethings is text because that's what they do generationally. So these are all things to think about. If you're in a public library or an academic library, how are you serving those specific customer bases? And what are their needs? And how do you find out? So these are some things to consider. Ah, uh, Steve Jobs, right? Yes, digitization and ebooks. Uh, how many people have ebook readers? Oh, I love mine. It's great for travel. You know, you just put it in the put it in the purse and away you go. You can have 200 books on your e-reader. And actually, there was a relatively new study that came out. A few, the Pew Internet Research Group in the United States did a study about uh, the 20-somethings. And what they found out as far as e-readers is that there was an increase 
from 19% of the people surveyed using e-readers and it's up to 25%. It's been very well publicized, that particular study. <clears throat> so changes are happening. There are, there are good changes, then there's some things that I was talking about, like budget cuts, which are a challenge to deal with. Um, organizations require frequent adjustments. We, on our campus, we have a new chancellor and we will be hire a new provost will be hired as well. That will be a big change for the library. If you're in a public library and you have a city or a town manager, depending on that structure, also a challenge. Uh, there are all kinds of things. The captain of the ship changes essentially. The leadership changes. So there are, there are sometimes fewer options for, for um, advancement too. And these things can be very stressful, even if it's a good change. Our, um, I have happy news on a family note, if you'll allow me to share it. Our son, who is 25 and living in Philadelphia, is going to get married. We just found out about three weeks ago, so that was, that's it's like, wow. <laughs> We're, Steve and I are still trying to wrap our minds around, around having a daughter-in-law. We think that would be wonderful, so she'll be welcome to our family next year. So it's stressful. It's a really good change. It's a happy change, but it's stressful, nonetheless. So, and it works the same way with libraries. So what are we going to do? Um, the libraries are evolving, and sometimes we're being pushed outside of our comfort zone. If you want to talk about a digitization project, if you've never done a digitization project, how do you get started? I mean, that's um, how do you get the funding, the staff, and the expertise. Uh, we had a project in our library. Uh, one of my favorite, favorite things about our library is we have a children's collection. Now, why in the world would we have a children's collection at the University of North Carolina? Well, we have a library school. So we have students who are going to be working in public libraries, in school libraries, and other settings. So we need to support the curriculum, and we also want to have the new books as well as the classic books for them to work with in terms of their classes. But the, with the copyright laws in the United States, the materials that are after 1923 cannot be digitized. We would be breaking copyright law and get the university in big trouble. So the university lawyer would be very unhappy if we did something like that. So what do we do with digitizing these materials? We did everything that was before 1923. And we were very fortunate because there was a Mellon grant that the university library had so we were able to fit in our digitization project. It was about 1,100 titles. And these are classic children's books from the ninth, well, it's about from 1870s up to the 19, well, just before 1923. So what happened with the, the scribe, the digitization machinery, is that they were doing some big jobs. Our job was little, so they were able to fit it in. And, that, and it's available through the Internet Archive. So if you go to Internet Archive, University of North Carolina, School of Information and Library Science, Juvenile Historical Collection, then you can see the materials online that we have. So that was a really cool thing, but it only took me 10 years to get that done. Yeah, it's the reason my hair is kind of silver. Anyway. <laughs> so, you know, it, it, it really does take a lot. It's like any kind of project, project management, whatever it is, it can be a great project, but it may really take a while until the technology, the staffing, and everything is there. So what works for you? What works in your own situation? We certainly want to stay relevant. I've already talked about the competition. And then, of course, there's the physical structure. On our campus, the building we are currently in was constructed in 1923. It is the old law school. Well, we have Wi-Fi, but you can't exactly drill through the walls. The architect, the historical historian, and architect person on campus, it's not allowed. You have to maintain the integrity of the building. So it is a, can be a bit of a challenge in terms of providing the latest technology at the same time preserving the historical integrity of the campus. So these are all things to think about in terms of, of, the, um, of what we need to be doing. It is certainly a challenge. Now, what about library as place? I've talked about I've talked about the students and the evolution of libraries. There is actually a, a United Kingdom website. It's called uh, Designing Libraries. 
David Lindley is the executive director of it. And basically, his research has shown that when a library redesigns the space, the usage will increase by 50%. So that's an interesting statistic in terms of how do adults, children, senior citizens, retirees, how do they use our services? How do they use our libraries? So this is certainly something to think about. How about creating that future? We all want to be there, right? But we have to be very intentional. Just like the, the um, iPhone app that we had at the campus, we have to look at the future. And the staff titles are blurry. If someone is very strong in technology, I'm a big believer in saying, all right, go and learn that. You know, if that worked to a person's strength, if they can handle that piece of it, it helps them grow as a person. They may still have the same job, but it is a way to build the skill sets. If a person has a particular language ability, growing that language ability. So that's what I'm talking about in terms of staff titles of blurring. In terms of library education, because I know we have a number of students here today, and I thank you for that. I'm just delighted that everybody's here today. Uh, Carol Tenefier is a University of Tennessee professor. And basically, she sums it up very nicely in the quote that you see. It's allowing our graduates to adapt and function in this world that is changing constantly. Any library journal that you read or if you're looking at library blogs, et cetera, et cetera, the change is immediate. It's happening now. So what type of attributes do our graduates have so that they can deal with this world that is constantly changing? And one of them is being a lifelong learner. Don't be satisfied with saying, I have my degree. I'm going to be a librarian for the next 30 years. That's lovely, but you need to keep constantly learning. If it is an area that that works uh, works out well for you, can we see everything? Then uh, just keep going with it. That's the best advice I have. And you know, if it's a little bit scary, if it's outside your comfort zone, then I think you should do it. If it's a new project, then be bold and say, you know, I'm in. I want to learn this new skill. I want to learn this new competences. All right, let's talk about customer service and teamwork. Exactly. So, what are our respective stakeholders after? Today's environment is changing very, very rapidly. Oh, I think we have a blank screen. I'm just going to keep talking. Uh, you know, I do a lot of teaching. I talk a great deal. No worries. No worries whatsoever. Yeah, so let's just keep talking about uh, the value of our libraries. Okay, let me guess the projector has to reset itself. Maybe it's a little tired this afternoon. It needs a little rest. <laughs> so essentially, in terms of customer service and teamwork, Today's environment is changing very, very rapidly. And there we are. <laughs> so essentially, I've talked about some of the budget decisions that have to be made, and the costs keep going up. The, uh, I work with, one of the, with the science team on our campus, and one of the things, a project that we have just finished, is we were looking at converting some print journals to electronic. And we found, frankly, that there was a shortfall in the budget. The publishers were providing a, they were asking, sometimes the prices were double or even triple, which is ridiculous. In term, it, it, it's the same content, it's, it's electronic, so what do you have to do with it that's gonna make the price so high? So there was a shortfall in terms of being able to convert everything to the electronic version, and what we did is we're keeping the print, and it's because of budgetary reasons. I, I don't know of any libraries who, who have plenty of funding and can just convert it all. That would be an unusual library from where I sit. So the costs are going up. So what are we going to do? Communicating our value. This is a library in Cuenca, Ecuador, and they do an amazing job with customer service, very much like your library here. And I wanted to show this to you. You see those wonderful photographs in the back? They're beautiful. They're absolutely beautiful. They have a program, a fine arts program in photography. So every year, and this is a small example, but I think it's so clever in terms of what the library staff is doing. They have an annual photography program. 
and they have uh, faculty members who are not in the department. Uh, they're the judges of the, photo the photographs, and then they display the winning photographs in the library. It's a great way to get the students to come in because their friend or their relative's photograph might be on display, and it's a, it's a great marketing tool in terms of getting people into the library and communicating the value. So these are the things that, that we do, and certainly our work is changing a great deal. All right, let's talk about communication. This is the beaver, the animal that can't hear. <laughs> the, um, we have to provide very clear, consistent messages. In order to accomplish that, library staff must know who their audience is. So who are your customers, and what are they can, interested in? And also listening skills. I can't underline that enough. My, my grandmother, my mother's grandmother, I always thought she was a very wise woman. And this is what she always said growing up. I remember her saying, a person has two ears and one mouth, so listen twice as much as you talk. <laughs> and I think she was on to something. So communication includes many, many elements. And it's not always necessarily about the language or the words that we choose. There is a study that is cited very, very often. The professor in 1967, who was at the University of California, Los Angeles, um, his work was published in two different psychology journals. And you can see those uh, behind me. And essentially, what this professor discovered, he did a series of studies communication studies with college students, right? He's on a college campus. It makes perfect sense. So what he ended up finding, it's, it's the 738-55 rule. And it's all about congruence. It's about verbal and non-verbal messages. Basically, what he discovered is that words, the words you're using, and that's 7% of his rule. It's the tone of voice that a person uses. That's 38%. But the body language is 55%. It's really intriguing, and I did put the uh, Wikipedia entry here. It, it's interesting to see uh, how that's quoted and how it's used in terms of communication. So essentially, in terms of library staff, we have to master the art of listening, much like the cat and the dog. They're not natural friends, are they? <laughs> None that I've known about. But focusing our listening on the customer's needs and creating buy-in for the customer and the services that the library is providing. You know, the human nature is to sort of go into what we call broadcast mode. If you think a person hasn't heard what you've said, now, uh, my children, for example, if I think my son hasn't heard, I'd say, well, have you cleaned up your room? You know, I'll just, I'll keep repeating it. I'll go into that broadcast mode. So essentially, you, you think that that information in your message was delivered, but what it really comes down to is taking time to listen and to acknowledge other points of view so that customers feel valued. And that's what it is. It's about customer relationship management. If you do much read, if you look in some of the library literature and the business literature, you'll, you'll see CRM. That's what it's called. And that's what we're, we're doing. Libraries, in a way, we are a business. It's, we're not for profit, but we are providing a service. And I think if we lose sight of that, that is a strategic error from where I sit. You have to follow up on the communication messages. And in other words, listening beneath the words. What is the person really asking? What are they really saying? And it's a bit harder to do because we do have all these wonderful tools. We have chat reference, but I can't see the person's face. So I don't know if they're puzzled about the database I'm talking about or another source. So it does make it a little bit, I think you have to question a bit more closely. So there are many valuable assets in terms of libraries. The information, the print collection, the electronic collection, but it's much more than that. Those are simply collections. It's the value of the staff. It's what you're bringing to the job and what you're bringing to the customers in terms of the library. The most valuable assets, in my opinion, are the people on our staff. So what competences do they need? Well, here are a few. And these are SLA uh, competences. In fact, the SLA list of competences, the document is being revised. There's a committee that's working on it the third time through. But if you think about product evaluation, if you have a database that 
the library may be having a trial for that you're planning to buy, then having someone or a team of people, including students and faculty, take a look at the product and evaluate it. Is it something that duplicates what you already have? What about the interface? Is it easy to use? Or is it something that's kind of clunky, not easy to use? We have a database, um, it's actually a children's literature, uh, it's a print reference tool, but I refuse to buy the online version because it's not very good. It's not inexpensive, and the interface, when you're trying to use it, is just, it's not instinctive in terms of going through it. Until it improves, it's not a product that we're going to put money into. So things like that. Uh, communication I've already talked about. Marketing, whether it's marketing through Facebook, are you using a tool like Pinterest, or does the library staff have a blog? Yes. So these are all things to think about. And budgeting and financial, I, if I could, I would underline budgeting and financial twice. Because I find it in library schools, at least in North America, this isn't something that's necessarily taught. And if you know your budget, if you know the numbers, then you know how things are really going. So even if you don't have an opportunity, and maybe you're not an accounting person, I'm not an accounting person, but I know the numbers. I can tell you where our acquisitions budget is, and that's the thing. If you're at all interested and you want to move up in administration, I think you want to really start getting some expertise or take a class in budgeting, taking a, man a management class. So those are just some of the things to think about. So what do we do as information professionals? Well, we manage the organizations, whether it's a public library or an academic library. We manage those resources like I was talking about, like the database, the electronic journals, the print subscriptions, and your services, the reference services, circulation services, interlibrary loan, the document delivery that's done, and the information tools and technologies. In our library, the information systems people, the library systems people, the department has just about tripled in size because so much of what we do is dependent on the digital world. So those are things to consider when you are looking at the attributes in terms of, in terms of staff. So here's my list in terms, of, in terms of staffing. I think we need to be very creative and enthusiastic. We enjoy working in libraries, and I think it's great to let our customers know how, how happy we are to help them and to share information about we, how we can help them in terms of if they're working on a master's degree or if they're taking an undergraduate class, having that enthusiasm and having terrific communication skills and also being very perceptive. What's going on in your organization? If you are in an organization that is a large campus like this one, do you have colleagues or do you make friends in other departments? It's very easy and wonderful to only talk to people who work in the library, but on a campus, you have to be so aware of what's going on campus-wide. Here's an example. We have um, a business school at the University of North Carolina, and at the business school, there was a innovation that's being talked about a great deal, and what's happening is that there's a bit of a movement on campus. It's involving a lot of faculty, and the chancellor has taken interest in this, so we're actually gonna start this academic year, it will start in September, we're doing an innovation, it's an innovation team, if you will. Any faculty that are interested, and I actually went on behalf of the library to a meeting, an organizational meeting, um, about six weeks ago. So what we'll be doing is looking at the role of innovation, and more and more at our university, the research that the faculty is doing is sometimes being spun off into a product, or it might be spun off into a small company, an incubator, if you will. So that's just one thing that's happening at the University of North Carolina. We also have the Research Triangle Park nearby, so it's a natural, it's very natural uh, collaboration, if you will, because we, of the research that's going on on campus. So that's just one thing. And the biggest one is marketing your library or information center. I can't emphasize that enough. You can have great resources, wonderful staff, but if people don't know about it, oh well, you know, they'll never use it. So, exactly. Marketing, marketing, marketing. And sometimes it doesn't always come naturally to us. 
but it is a skill that you can learn. Kim Doherty is one of my favorite authors. She is at the University of Colorado in Denver, and one of the books that she's written is called Rethinking Information Work. And this is really a book that talks about a career path, what a library does, and in this world, this Google world that we live in, where are we going? Especially if you look at our users and changing expectations. People have very different expectations. Once in a while, I'll hear a student say, oh, I, I didn't have to go to the library at all, and now I'm graduating. And so one of the big challenges is sometimes the students don't realize that the database he or she is using is actually something that the library is supplying. So doing a better job of marketing is something that we need to do. Also, Kim Doherty writes a lot about disintermediation between the user and the information sources, and exactly what I just said in terms of the fact that the user doesn't necessarily realize that this is provided by the library. The user is going directly to the database through the university website, and they're like, oh, okay, well, there's no intervention with the library. This is just somehow here for me to use. Yes, a mysterious process. So those are some things to consider. Also, in terms of competences, the ability to be able to make a transition. I talked about technical services and cataloging, and also a track record of, inno of innovation. So in your library, in your environment, where are the unmet needs? Are there people like my mother-in-law who are absolutely terrified of this computer? Well, if you're in a public library setting, perhaps there are classes for senior citizens or retirees. Are um, you working in a situation where there are children so that you could do, what, and many, so many public libraries already do this the, in terms of pajama story time or craft sessions, et cetera, et cetera. The uh, one thing that I've seen recently in public libraries is in Detroit, Michigan, and they have a grant. It's, it's great when you have wonderful grant writers on your staff, but they're using 3D printers. Those are the big thing right now in science libraries. Frankly, the academic libraries in the United States haven't really figured out how we're going to use 3D printers, but the public libraries are doing a better job with it. And essentially, at the Detroit Public Library, they are doing amazing sessions for teens. They targeted ages 12 through 18. Uh, there are maker spaces, basically where people are inventing and collaborating. But if you're a parent, this is not a place I would feel comfortable having a child go, because it's usually somebody's garage or whatever not in the best place. So the public library in Detroit saw an opportunity. They seized it. They brought in 3D printers. They have different programs and different instructors so that teenagers are actually using their creativity and they're creating, they're using the, the uh, CAD software, engineering, drafting type software to do designs. And sometimes it's an afternoon of making a design and walking out with a really cool t-shirt but it, it, the, the teenagers have a chance to be very, very creative. So that's just one example, and that's one driver. If you'd asked me last year about 3D printers, I would have said, so what about 3D printers? But in the public libraries in the United States, they are really they're doing a lot, especially in the large urban public libraries. Academic libraries were still working on But where's that unmet market? The um, other piece of this, in terms of Kim Doherty, is she also talks a lot about expanding your skills to keep up with the new technologies. If you're in a museum or a library, how about user-generated content? You may have somebody who is an expert on local history. Well, there is a way to collaborate with that person in terms of metadata for a collection, especially from a museum point of view. So there are lots of cultural institutions that can leverage new opportunities too. So these are just many things to consider. When you begin to think about Innovation, one of the first people who comes to mind is Mike Walsh. Mike Walsh wrote a book that is called Future Tainment. You see it on the screen there. And essentially, he was, he was in San Diego at the Special Libraries Association, and he uh, was our keynoter in June. So I wanted to give you a sense of what he said about innovation. It's very, very interesting. Basically, he says, if you could start with a clean sheet of paper, what would you do? If you could redesign your library totally, how would you do this? And his 
mantra is to think big and to think quick. Basically, he calls these mind grenades. He talked a lot about the next generation of users. And so, here we go, the thing my mother-in-law doesn't want, right? One of these smartphones. So, I, I don't know what I'd do without my smartphone. But at any rate, in terms of the next generation of users, the teenagers, the 20-somethings, if you ask a teenager in the United States if they would give up, which would they give up? You have to give up one of them. Would you give up a car or would you give up one of these? So which is it? What do you think they would say that they would give up? The car. They're not going to give up their cell phones. Are you kidding me? Right, right, exactly. So these are some of the variables that we have to look at. The other thing that Mike Walsh talked about is he also talked about the line between technology and innovation being very small. And one of the approaches I, that he suggested, and I tried this, I thought, hmm. He said, if your child, whether it's a seven-year-old or a teenager or 20-something, was doing your job, now this was mind-blowing. I was thinking about one of my sons sitting my, in my office doing my job. Now, how would he do my job? It, it, it's, but that was, um, and Mike Walsh, if you decide to read his book, it's very good. And he does talk, he calls these mind grenades, because you're really changing your focus. So just something else to, just else, something else to consider. The line between technology and innovation is very, very small. And this uh, picture of a washing machine is, uh, we, we were talking, discussing about information being organic, and particularly from an innovation point of view, essentially, he shared this story with the audience, and I'll share it with you today. He said there was a village in China that had one washing machine, and the company kept having to send a repair person out, like very often, every couple of weeks, to repair the washing machine. Well, what were they doing with this washing machine that was causing an issue? The filter was the problem in the washing machine. The repair person had to keep going out there. And what they discovered is that the villagers were using the washing machine to wash potatoes. They weren't using them to wash clothes. <laughs> Do you know what the clever people at the company who made the washing machine did? You know what they did. They made a potato washing machine. They changed the filter so that then they could sell it. So it's a very small line between, between technology and innovation. So what do our users want? What's that, what are they using now, that washing machine, if you will, that they really want a potato washer for? I thought it was priceless, and it applies in libraries all over. So, so just think about it. Okay, let's talk a little bit about assessment. Where are those new opportunities? Um, I've talked a lot. What about, do our, what do our customers value, and how can we make a difference? So essentially, these are, this is us, this is Peter Drucker. If you read any Peter Drucker management book, this is essentially what you're getting. Who's your mission? Who is the mission? What is your mission? Who are you? Who's your audience? And the library always has to be in line strategically with the organization. And what does the customer value? So what sort of a strategic plan do you have? All things, this is classic business literature to think about within the organization. Coca-Cola, all right. We arrived in Thailand, in Bangkok. Steve and I were there uh, before, we, before we came here. And we came in, it was very late at night, midnight, right? Because we've been flying, it took 31 hours from our home to Bangkok. And this is not unusual, right? I mean, this is, and we were lucky. We made all our airline connections, so that was good. Sometimes you're not that lucky. So we get into the hotel where we were staying. It was very comfortable, and they have a refrigerator. And so I open the refrigerator, the small refrigerator, and I see the bottle of water, and then I see this bottle, and I'm like, Coca-Cola, I know what that is. So it's branding. Whether I'm in the United States or I'm in Thailand, I know what I'm going to get. I know what the product is, and that's the message. It's charting that course for our libraries. How are you branding your library? When your customers look at the services, are they going to say, oh, I know what that is. I know what your brand is. So, I've talked about who your customers are and how are they going to change. Essentially, the information needs of customers are changing. The technology is driving this need. 
We still have tra traditional delivery methods. We have chat reference. Uh, some libraries are using an iPad for roving reference, which is kind of cool. That's a really interesting way to do it if it works. The, the jobs in academic libraries are becoming more specialized. So essentially, the jobs in bibliographic instruction, in teaching classes, in assessment are on the rise. That's what I'm seeing in terms of academic libraries. Also, our library is about to embark with a, a patron-driven acquisition program, which we haven't done before. Uh, Duke University did it. They ran out of money in six weeks. Uh, that doesn't happen to us. Actually, what we're doing is we're putting a very specific budget, and if people use it up more, if they use it up more quickly, then the fund will just be out. So we're putting some controls around it. So these are things to consider whenever you are looking at different types of services. Speaking of change, in North Carolina, where we live, we have a very large population of people who speak Spanish. So the children's collection that I am building today is not necessarily for today, but it's in 10 or 20 years from now. I began to buy bilingual children's books because the students we have on our campus today will not be the same in 10 or 20 years. The librarians we are training will be working. Many of them will be bilingual. They'll be in a public library where you need to be able to speak English and Spanish. So looking ahead to that sort of a need is something that we all need to do. I just wanted to share an example from our environment. And to give you an idea of how fast the population is growing, in the last 10 years, the Spanish-speaking population has grown by 357%. Yes, 357%. It is tremendous, and it's really changing. It's changing the libraries, and it's going to change our campus. It will change the way the classes are taught, too. What are some other things? Data stewards, data librarians. This is a big, big deal. The National Science Foundation in the United States that gives so many grants to scientists, to faculty who are teaching, have to have a data steward now. So if you're doing a grant, if you have terabytes of data, you have to have someone who is responsible for it. So who's that going to be? In some academic libraries, this is a role for the libraries. If you want to read more about big data and what's happening, then I have this link as well. So if you're looking at, at sciences and you're looking at big data sets, you're looking at supercomputing. So at any rate, these are just things to consider. How about MOOCs? How about them? <coughs> Well, massive open online courses. At the university where I work, which I did experiment this year, we are doing four MOOCs. One professor is a music professor, and he is very clever because he's getting around the copyright laws. You see, if your professor is teaching a MOOC, by the contracts we sign with our publishers, the, the students in the MOOCs cannot use our databases. It, it just, the publishers, we aren't paying for it, so obviously fair is fair. They're not going to give people access. So understood. So how can a professor teach a MOOC successfully? Well, this music professor is very smart. So what he's doing is he's using musical performances that he and his friends have done over the years to teach his class his MOOC on music. So I thought, well, that's pretty clever. I admire that. In the library science world, one of our faculty members is teaching a MOOC. He is teaching a MOOC on metadata. And he has 12,000 students signed up. <laughs> 12,000. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. It's going to be interesting to see how it all proceeds. Another driver, essentially uh, cloud computing. We've talked a lot about the impact of technology. In terms of charting a course for the future of libraries, our staffing needs are changing rapidly. Reference <coughs> desks are changing to meet the information needs. I saw wonderful examples here, so I thank you for that. The um, a role that for libraries is to consider focusing on information management as instead of completely focusing on content, because that's what we've done in the past. We built a collection, we built a print collection, we built a digital collection. But our value is in direct correlation to the value of the information that we're delivering to our customers. So we are facing all the forces of competition that I've talked about. We are Look, we have to be leaders in being relevant and very competitive. We have to look around. So in looking around this room, I see all of you, and I, again, thank you so much for spending part of your afternoon with, with me. But I see the most valuable assets that we have in libraries, people. 
and to plan effectively for the future, we have to make sure that we have training that is relevant and also educational programs. And that, that might be through your local association, through an organization like IMPLA. But think about taking a risk. And Teddy Roosevelt said it best. You know, in any decision, the best thing you can do is the right thing. The worst thing you can do is nothing. Because then you will not have the customers. You will not be making decisions. So it's time to revitalize libraries. Libraries are evolving, and it's a wonderful time to be in our profession. So the journey is long. We have a lot of opportunities. But working together, we can accomplish great things. In terms of accomplishing that and looking to the future, what I'd like to do is to share one last closing um, inspirational thought. And it's not mine. It's Mark Twain, one of my favorite authors. In looking to the future, essentially, Mark Twain talks about 20 years from now. What can you do in terms of strategies? Well, we have to embrace the chaos that is sometimes the world that we live in now. Well, you have to take some reasoned risks and invest in yourself. I've talked about education. I've talked about programs. In terms of Mark, I've talked about the most valuable assets. And this is the observation that I wanted to share with you from Mark Twain. So 20 years from now, you'll be more disappointed by the things you didn't do than by the ones that you did do. So throw off the bow lines and sail away from that safe harbor. Catch the trade winds in your sails and take the opportunity to explore and to discover. Thank you very much for your time. Questions, comments? <coughs> There are many stereotypes surrounding, surrounding the title librarian. And what happens most often whenever I travel and talk to people who are not in our profession is that they only think books. They, so I think it's up to us to educate them in the sense of the digital resources, the specialized collection. If, if you have a, a library where you are a data steward, or GIS, GIS is another area that in our university is growing and growing. We have a department of city and regional planning, so it makes perfect sense that GIS would, would be uh, a, an area to expand in. So what I think is that, what is what does your university, what does your public library have, and where are those opportunities? Where can we expand? But it is up to us, and hopefully our professional associations are helping as well to break some of the stereotypes in terms of librarians, but we have to also we also have to share and say, I'm a librarian and I'm proud to be a librarian. Exactly. Thank you. That was well. well
well said. Anything else? Of course, is always uh, that's always a good a 
good strategy. So those are the things that come to mind. Because you're right, it is, it's all about Google, and people think if I just Google it, then everything's fine. And there are some things that are fine, but there's some other things, there's a lot of misinformation.